What I'd like to do now is start to talk about Java and the Java programming language and the Java virtual machine. And the goal here is to acquaint you with the key object-oriented and generic programming features that are part of Java. I'm assuming you have some basic knowledge of what's in Java. So a method, a type, an expression, control constructs like a loop, a do loop, uh, or do while, or a uh, for loop, a while loop, those kinds of things. So we will cover some of that, but I'm assuming that you already know what that is. Uh, by the time we're done with this lecture and the couple ones that relate to it, you probably will not be a Java expert yet, in, unless you already happen to be one, because that's not the goal. Um, however, you'll be able to know how to do all the assignments, and you'll get a chance to become a Java expert by the time the course is done. If you really know Java well, then some parts of the intro may be a little dull, because I'm going to mention the six parts of a method, for example. Um, but uh, just you know, be patient. That'll go by fast. What's important here is that everything we talk about, you will see when you do the assignments. So it's important to at least have been exposed to it. Um, if you have questions and I go buy something too fast, obviously stop and I'll go down and, and uh, go into more detail. Later portions of this intro to Java will go into a lot more detail about things that you probably know nothing about. Um, for example, there's some really cool stuff in Java 8 now called Lambda expressions or method references or the streams uh, programming model and so on. And we'll talk about those things. Most people, most professionals don't know anything about them. I would be shocked if people here knew them. If you are an expert in Java already, though, and you find yourself really bored, uh, come see us. We have projects we can have you work on uh, if this is too, too elementary. So we'd be happy to get you involved in an independent study project. I should also mention, by the way, that um, every spring, towards the end of the spring semester, there's a uh, Vanderbilt Summer Research Opportunities Program for undergrads to do research. And inevitably, we have a student or two from this class who gets involved and works on cool stuff. And um, some of the TAs you'll meet in the class have actually done that before. So keep your eyes out for that. There's some good opportunities there. Yes, and it's very fun. OK, so let's talk about Java. This particular segment doesn't have any code examples, per se. It just talks about the concepts. Later, it has lots and lots and lots of code examples. All right, so what is Java? Well, Java is actually a lot of things these days, especially Java 8. But initially, it was meant to be an object-oriented programming language. It got its start in the early 90s, written by a guy who was at Sun at the time named James Gosling. And he'd done a lot of interesting sort of scripting languages over the years. And Java was kind of this clever little scripting dynamic language that he developed. It looked a lot like C++ from a syntax point of view, but its semantics were intentionally meant at the time to be a lot simpler and more consistent than C++ for a variety of different reasons. You can take a look here for more information about Java. In an object-oriented language, the features that are provided are organized around objects and data as opposed to um, functions and actions. And that's an important distinction. Now, that, that's in an object-oriented programming language. Uh -huh. um, and so, so this is significant because we don't, in, in Java historically, we didn't really think about functions very much. We thought about how things were grouped in forms of classes and so on. And um, uh, you can read more about that here. Java has a number of different object-oriented programming features that are worth talking about. There's a good paper by the inventor of C++, Bjorn Strustrup, many, many years ago, who wrote What is Object-Oriented Programming? Paper's still relevant, and he talks about these key things, which are widely agreed upon by most people as being the core feature set in an object-oriented language. The first feature is called abstraction. And abstraction is all about separating interface from implementation or implementations. Now, if you look at the history of computing, abstraction and the abstraction process has been going on almost from the very, very beginning. Uh, does anybody know why that is? Why, why do people want abstraction? What is the, the benefit of abstraction? Because it's easier to swap out what it means if you have like a header file. All the people that are using your code, it allows them to not have to worry about how it works. So you can, uh, I think the point you're making is that you can de-emphasize low-level implementation details and focus on more stable things like methods and other things that are more, are less likely to change. So that, that, that's an important concept. 
What's an example of abstraction? What's an example of an abstraction in a language? So, so the print. So, what's the abstraction? Oh, just like <coughs> being able to print to the console without having to know how exactly it's done. Great. So, the concept of of I/O abstraction, right? Back in the old days, when you know you were writing with card decks and so on, you you would as physically um, you would physically denote a specific printer at some port, you know, like in hardware. And of course, over time, people have abstracted away from that, so it's much easier to work with many different types of devices, like a printer or a USB connector or a wireless network or whatever. So yeah, uh, IO abstraction is a great example. What are some other examples of abstractions that... Functions, functions right. So back in the bad old days, uh, people would write assembly code and they would jump all over the place with go-tos and labels and branches and it was very hard to figure out the flow in the program. So function abstraction is something that allowed people to have a single entry point into some chunk of code and then some way of getting out of that code at back to where you came from. And there's lots and lots of other examples. There's, there's name abstraction, so you don't have to refer to things by their physical hardware address. You can refer to them symbolically by variable names. That was in assembly code in the early days. Control abstractions, data abstractions, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> As we'll see, the kinds of abstractions that Java provides can apply to both data and control. And here are some of these many, 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 many examples of abstraction in Java. So classes, which you hopefully all know, and iteration mechanisms, loops, <coughs> iterators, um, various things like the for each uh, uh, function that's applied in Java 8 and so on and so forth. Those are all examples of, of abstractions. The next thing that Java provides is something that's called inheritance. And you've probably been exposed to this a little bit in 101, 201. We're going to go into it a lot more here in this class. Basically what it allows is it allows a subclass to receive and optionally customize or override methods and data defined in a so-called superclass. If this was C++, it would be called a derived class, not a subclass, and a base class, not a superclass, basically the same idea. So there's this notion of a hierarchy, and so you, you design your software by pushing certain capabilities up the inheritance tree so everything below it will inherit it. And then you can customize and reuse the stuff in lower levels of the design structure. You'll see lots and lots of examples of that. The Java extends keyword is an example of how Java implements inheritance. So if you have a class like um, HashMap, you may or may not have seen HashMap. HashMap is a map that maps keys to values. A HashMap extends abstract map which is a more general data structure that's shared by lots of different kinds of maps. Tree maps, concurrent hash maps, and so on. <clears throat> now, inheritance is cool, but inheritance is most cool when it's combined with another important concept called dynamic binding. And dynamic binding allows the dynamic dispatching of a method based on the type of the object the method is invoked on. We'll go through this in a lot more detail. Um, the, basically, the idea here is often when you develop your programs, you know what the interfaces should be, you know what the methods should be, but at some level of your design phase, you don't yet know what the implementation should look like. So just to go back to the abstract map concept. So abstract map is a, an abstract class in Java, and what that means is it defines methods like put and get, to put and get values into the map, but it doesn't know how those things will be implemented. It doesn't know if they'll be implemented as a tree, or as a hash table, or as a concurrent hash table, or whatnot. It has no idea. It just knows that there will be methods called put and get and you know, entry set and so on. And it leaves it up to the subclasses, the things that inherit from the abstract map, like hash map or concurrent hash map, to come along and fill in what it means to put and get for those particular data structure implementations. So when you took data structures course in 201, you probably talked a lot about different ways of representing data. The cool thing about inheritance and dynamic binding is these features are used in Java in order to be able to have a base interface or a base abstract class that defines the method signatures, the basic method parameters and names and return values and so on. And then they defer the actual choice of implementation to subclasses. And there's a whole bunch of good virtues that come from this. 
This is often called something called late binding. And Java virtual methods, which by default everything is virtual in Java, um, those are examples of dynamically bound uh, abstractions in Java. Now, to compare and contrast that, there are three other types of methods in Java that are not dynamically <coughs> bound. And these are statically bound, or early bound, or statically dispatched, as the word is sometimes used. A static dispatch method makes the selection at compile time, not runtime. And some examples in Java are private methods, final methods, and static methods. And we'll talk a lot more about that stuff later. You've probably been exposed maybe to private methods. I'm not sure how much you would have done with final or static in 101. And then the, the fourth key feature in OO, which is not quite at the same level of significance as the other three, but nonetheless is very useful and you'll have to learn how it works, is exception handling. And exception handling is basically used to decouple the normal processing flow when everything goes well from the processing flow when everything doesn't go well. And so uh, in Java, they, they distinctly separate those things out. And if something goes awry, then a so-called exception is thrown. And that is handled in a different way than the normal return path. And the other great thing about exceptions, as we'll see, is you can't ignore them. They have to be dealt with it some way. Java has a couple different ways of handling exceptions, so-called checked and unchecked exceptions. We'll see all those things later. <coughs> now, Java is by no means the only object-oriented language. There's also C++, of course, the granddaddy in the current genre of OO languages, although there's many that predate that, like Smalltalk and Simula, uh, as well as other newer languages that are very much like Java, like C Sharp, which is uh, C Sharp and Java go back and forth, kind of stealing each other's features and so on. And uh, but that's a sort of a Microsoft-only thing. And then Python, which is another popular language for object-oriented programming. And if you go here, you can find out more than you ever possibly wanted to know about all the other languages. Let's see, make that. All right, why this is not working, I don't know, but I'll fix it later. OK. So that's object-oriented programming. That is the, the 80s and the 90s were all about object-oriented programming and object-oriented design. And you can do some really cool things with that. Early Java was very object-oriented in its nature. But for a variety of reasons, that's not the only programming model that Java supports. In fact, if you take a look at Java 8, this next model that we're about to talk about is actually becoming almost the predominant approach. Although I like the fact you can mix and match these two paradigms, as we'll see in a second. This other paradigm goes by a number of different names. I'm going to happen to pick a particular name because I think it's more descriptive and less loaded. It's called generic programming. And you can find out more about generic programming here. Generic programming allows a type or method to operate on objects of various types. So for example, you might have a stack. And with generics, as we'll see, you can have a stack of t which is why there's this funny cup of tea thing here, other than being a pun. It's, this is a generic type. And the way that these work is you can have a, a data structure, like an abstract data type. And the type that it operate, the type that the methods operate on is generic. In other words, it can be replaced by other classes. Not built-in types, but other classes. <coughs> and there's a bunch of different reasons why you want to do this, the most important of which is it greatly reduces duplication of code, because now you can have the data structure and the algorithm common, and the type of data that's manipulated by the data st uh, structure becomes a variable, becomes a parameter, so that uh, the amount of code you have to duplicate and write is driven down very much. And the second thing is it becomes type safe, because you don't have to do casts in your code. The casts are hidden inside the implementation of the underlying generic uh, class. Now, there are some quirks. Java's generics are a little bit weird in some ways, but it's a cool thing. And it's everywhere in Java, so you just have to get used to it. This is also a realization of a common pattern 
used heavily in agile programming called don't repeat yourself. And the idea here is you don't want to do something more than once. If you start doing something more than once, you have a problem. So for, let's say you write a, a piece of code to sort some data type. And then you decide you want to sort a different type of data. Well, you have two choices, right? You can either cut and paste your old solution to work with a new data type, or you can refactor your code to use generics or some other means of genericity, and then have one thing that works for two different types or n different types. Why would you prefer to use the one that works with multiple types as opposed to having multiple copies that work with different types? What's the reasoning behind that? Perfect. So it's the don't repeat yourself, right? So the minute you start repeating yourself, then chances are if you make a change to one of your copies, you'll have to either go through laboriously and find everywhere else you made the change and change it there, or you'll have dreaded inconsistency show up in your code such that you'll have um, some versions that work one way, some versions that work another. And this becomes particularly pernicious when you fix bugs because some of your code will be fixed and some of your code will not be fixed. So when in, when in doubt, a good rule is to refactor, use genericity, use generics, and avoid all this headache. <coughs> generics are heavily, heavily used in the Java collections framework, which you can read about here. Uh, we will look at this a lot more later. It looks like a lot of stuff. Um, <coughs> the basic abstractions are lists, queues, sets of various flavors, and then these guys get customized in all kinds of different crazy ways. And uh, <coughs> there's maps and so on and, and other stuff here that's really cool. We'll look at a lot. We'll use these as running examples throughout the course. Java, Java has had generics for quite a long time. Java 8, which is the new version of Java that came out recently, goes even further and adds a pile of new functional programming features to Java. Uh, you can read more about functional programming here. This is becoming all the rage these days. So something called Lambda, it's not Lamba, it's, <coughs> it's Lambda. Lambda expressions. Lambda expressions are basically um, syntactic sugar that removes all the boilerplate code except for the actual logic you want to be run. And that you can pass these things around as first class entities in various ways. It's really cool. Uh, lambda expressions, method references, something called streams. I, I won't expect you to know the details of these now, but we'll cover them probably uh, next Monday. If you want to learn more about this stuff, there's a really cool article here or read the Java tutorial uh, online stuff to learn about this stuff. C++ has many of the same capabilities with respect to generic programming and functional programming. So C++ has something called the standard template library. If we were teaching this class in the old days, we'd be doing lots of STL stuff here. <coughs> the main difference between C++ and Java's approach to this is that C++ goes further than Java at being able to have generic functions called algorithms that work on user-defined types and built-in types without any changes in the code. So with C++ in the way that they do generic programming, built-in types and user-defined types are really interchangeable. With Java, the generic programming stuff works differently for built-in types than from user-defined types. And if you're used to Java, it doesn't seem all that weird. If you're used to C++, it's weird because it's inconsistent um, and less powerful. But they have, both of them have very, very similar patterns and, and idioms that you use. So once you know one, it's really easy to learn the other. OK, so the way Java works most of the time, not everywhere, most of the time, is that the Java code that you write, which you'll write, so you have Java source code, gets turned into Java bytecode by a Java compiler. Now, the compiler may be hidden a bit from you, so when you start using Eclipse, as you'll use here, the compiler is sort of magic, and it does incremental compilation and recompilation in the background, and you make changes, and it just sort of works, and so on and so forth. If you were using a command line environment, you might have a little bit more to have to see and do. But basically, it turns the source code into bytecode. And the bytecode is basically just a, an abstract instruction set for a virtual machine that knows how to interpret that code. And the Java virtual machine is the software hardware processor. It's a software processor that reads the bytecode and then runs it. And of course, as we'll see here, um, 
once you compile the source code into the, the dot class files, which are just basically bytecode, <coughs> then uh, this stuff can be run on many different underlying platforms. So Java Virtual Machines have been ported to Mac OS, Linux, many different versions of Unix, different versions of Windows, blah, 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 all over the place. Um, one of the cool things about this, of course, is it's more cross-platform. There's other ways to skin this cat, but this is the Java way of doing things. And the guys in, in Java world have worked pretty hard, not 100% not successful, but most of the time you get very good backward compatibility at the language level and the virtual machine level, which makes it easier to write code that will run on different platforms. That initially was their, their mantra. Um, what was it? Wara. Um, basically, write once, run anywhere. <laughs> W-O-R-A. Write once, run anywhere. For various reasons, that didn't quite work, but it's still pretty easy to write Java code that'll work in different environments. The other big win that you get with uh, Java is support for garbage collection. So uh, for those of you who took 101 here and then you took 201, you probably had to spend some time in 201 learning about operator new and delete, whereas in Java, you just have to learn about operator new. And uh, in C++, if you don't take care to delete your memory properly, weird things happen. You eventually will run out of memory. Or even worse, uh, in C++ and C, if you incorrectly delete your memory, it ends up going in strange places and your, your program crashes. And honestly, one of the main reasons why we switched from C++ to Java in this class is that <coughs> people were spending too much time wrestling with those things and not really having a chance to learn the concepts. So we will hopefully have an easier experience here by using Java. Um, garbage collection makes things easier because all these problems go away. So you don't have dangling pointers and double deletions and memory leaks and so on. And this is especially important when we start trying to write multi-threaded code that has to talk to things that run across different address space boundaries, different processes, different machines. Keeping track of when you can free stuff up gets really hard. There are some downsides, however. Um, some of the main downsides are additional overhead and non-determinism. So for the kind of stuff we're doing here, it's probably not the end of the world if periodically your demo application has to stop and free up a bunch of memory. It's just a small pause. If you were writing a, a pacemaker or a nuclear reactor uh, control system or a missile defense system, the fact that your program periodically stopped and waited while it went and freed up all the memory might become a, a life or death kind of thing. Most modern Java implementations have very sophisticated garbage collectors, which essentially go through periodically and find the memory that's not being accessed at the moment, rearrange stuff so that that becomes part of what's known as the, the free list or the heap or whatever. <coughs> and the other memory that's in use continues to be in use, but it allows the program to not have to worry about manually deleting things. All right, next topic, virtual, oh, first of all, any questions about that? So hopefully you guys are pretty familiar with a lot of this stuff. The Java virtual machine, you may or may not be familiar with this, depends on what your background is. So a virtual machine, virtual machines are all the rage, they've been around for a long time, but <coughs> in recent years they've become a lot more popular again. In the early days of computing, people used virtual machines because they wanted to be able to offer up uh, different computing environments to users so more users could make use of expensive hardware without having to leave the hardware idle because hardware was so expensive back in the 50s and 60s that you wanted to keep them running all the time. Then it, when we went through a period where everybody had plenty of processing power galore and so virtual machines became less important, people wanted performance and so they didn't use virtualization. They tended to write applications for Windows or some version of Unix or whatever. And in recent years, virtual machines have made a big comeback. Does anybody want to speculate on what has made virtual machines become more popular in the last decade or so. Sam? Phones. Phones. So wh but why would that make them popular? They don't have as much processing power. So phones don't have as much processing power. Um, on the other hand, phones are, because of the fact they don't have much processing power, virtual machines tend to slow them down. So cloud computing. So what is it about cloud computing that makes virtual machines um, uh, you know, relevant? You're interacting with the server. It's not, it's not tangible. Okay, so, so the observation here is um, 
people want to be able to run applications in the cloud, like your storage or your email. You don't really care where it runs. You just want it run somewhere. And so in those environments, we often want to virtualize the hardware so that if somebody runs an application and it's a Windows application, you can get commodity, say, x86 hardware, and you can load up an image that would be a Windows image, or a Mac OS image, or a Linux image, or a Solaris image, or whatnot. So that's one model of virtualization. That's really slightly different use of the word virtualization. That's actually virtualization. We're talking about virtual machines. Where virtual machines, if you recall, virtual machines are really having software execution of the instructions. So that's, that's a key distinction, software execution of the instructions. So, so why has that become popular? Yeah. Ah, so you're getting on an important point, which is really at the heart of a lot of this stuff. So if you take a look up there, you see the word managed runtime. So when you start running things in your browser where you've downloaded code from somewhere else, you probably, and actually very wisely, don't want to let random code come rampage through the memory on your, on your phone. Because if you do, bad things will happen. Now, bad things happen anyway, but that's another story. Um, so you want to try to minimize that. And so older languages like C++ and C, which do not have virtual machine infrastructures out of the box, let you address pretty much any part of your program almost any time with some protection by the process me mechanisms that we'll talk about later. But you can overwrite all kinds of data structures and destroy the state of memory on your machine very easily in those environments. That leads to all kinds of opportunities for exploits and vulnerabilities or just plain buggy code, right? So one of the things that Java does, because it's a managed environment, is it's much stricter about what code can be doing what in the environment in which it runs. And so the runtime environment of a Java virtual machine is managed, so there's a lot more checks to make sure you're not overwriting the ends of arrays, a lot more range checking, a lot more checking to make sure you have the right permissions at the right time to do various kinds of operations. So, so the reason it's become more popular is because people are using stuff in a more um, interesting way, as you were describing. So that's the pull dimension, right? So people want to be able to do more things, and we want to be able to write code that will allow that to happen. There's another dimension, which is more of a technology push dimension, which is hardware is now fast enough that you can afford to have some overhead from a virtual machine and still have stuff that works in a reasonably interactive way, whereas 10, 15, 20 years ago, hardware wasn't so good, memory was not so plentiful, and so you'd see a dr dramatic difference in performance by using a managed environment versus a non-managed environment. And one of the reasons why things like Java, C Sharp, Python, you know, JavaScript, all these managed languages have become so popular is because the hardware lets them be popular because it doesn't have a noticeable difference in performance. There's a difference in performance, but it's typically not noticeable because the hardware's gotten fast enough. So that's what a JVM provides, a managed runtime environment. You can read more about it here. Uh, basically, you take the Java source code, turn it into a byte code, and this then runs inside a host operating system process. That's what's called a process virtual machine. And so this stuff gets loaded and run inside of the address space, which has an interpreter running inside of it. And it abstracts away most of the details of the underlying operating system and hardware platform. So your Java programs will run on top of Unix, Windows, Mac OS, et cetera. Pretty much doesn't care. It shouldn't care if it's written correctly and you stick within the, the constraints that the language and the runtime give you. And of course, those things are abstracted away from the underlying hardware. So you have a lot of nice abstraction. A Java application typically runs inside its own process, inside its own JVM instance. So if you had a, a Java-based browser application, which you most likely would if you're running, say, on Android, <coughs> then this runs inside a process. Some parts are written in C. Some parts are written in Java. Some parts are written in a combination of C and Java. Other parts are written purely in Java. And so that's what makes your entire app is this, this stack of multi-languages that all work together in a managed context. When the process starts up, the virtual machine is started, the bytecode is loaded and run, and when everything's done, it's destroyed and goes away. All right, here are some other places to go for more information about this stuff. So uh, you can go and either go to this link or you can buy this book. Why you would want to buy the book is beyond me, but if you go to the link, you'll find all the tutorials for Java, really good stuff there. And if you need the APIs, 
than simply go here. Now, a little bit of uh, a hint for the course. So uh, your best friend, aside from the discussion forum for the next 14 weeks, is Google or Bing or whatever your favorite search engine is. And inevitably, you will come across something. You will say, I want to know how the Java hash map works. Well, one thing you could do is you could wait and come to office hours and ask the TA, what is a Java hash map? Or you could post a message to the discussion group and say, what is a Java hash map? But by far, the fastest way to find the answer is to say, you know, Java hash map. And voila, inevitably, the first thing that pops up will be the documentation for the Java hash map, which is usually very well explained. And these days, nowadays, you'll find like the class explanation, like, the, like the, in other words, the Java class hash map, hash map. You'll also typically find a tutorial that explains how to use it. And you'll probably find something on one or more articles on Stack Overflow, which is a great website to get accustomed to, where people have asked esoteric things like, <clears throat> what's the concurrency properties of a Java hash map? You know, if you type that in, you will find the Stack Overflow answer to that question. So absolutely get in the habit of looking in those places first. The minute you're stumped, go look at that stuff. And that habit will serve you very well because that way you'll know the answer right away and you won't have to wait for someone else to give you the answer. If you're still stumped, of course, we're more than happy to help you. But uh, get in the habit of looking in those places first and you'll find an enormous amount of stuff is right at your fingertips. <clears throat>